Ladies and gentlemen, there is something you all need to know and you need to hear. Those of you who understand a little bit about law, you may understand this or you may not understand it. I cannot help you if you can't get it. The Seventh Amendment says that all suits at controversy shall be preserved the right to a trial by jury, and no facts determined by that jury shall be overturned by any court. Well, what the courts have done is they've taken away that right by claiming it doesn't apply to suits in equity, where you are not given the right to a jury. Suits in equity is just where the judge gets to make the decision. Well, all of your trials, all of your hearings are in equity. Why? Because no fact determined by a jury shall be overturned by any court means that the court can't tell the jury what to do. The juries tell the court what to do. Go back and look at the Seventh Amendment. Now, what's happening is that the courts are now saying the common law that it's referring to is the common law of England. <laughs> God, that's stupid. They just had a revolution. A revolution where they succeeded from England. So why would they have a revolution succeeding from England and then adopt this common law? Stupid. So what happens is in 1692, when Columbus supposedly sailed the ocean blue, they had been here almost 100 years. They had established laws within those communities. They didn't just abandon those laws and get rid of them. They didn't abandon their courts and get rid of the processes of their courts. The common law was those laws that they had developed and they did borrow from the English common law. That's why the Supreme Court can say that the common law of the colonists was that of England because they borrowed from it, but hold on, they modified it. So this was the conversation with this moron. Let's tell it to you. The term common law in the Seventh Amendment could be interpreted to refer to the legal system used in court and employed juries as opposed to other legal systems like equity courts. This is a valid and important perspective that has been argued by some scholars and legal professionals that the colonists did modify the common law to fit their specific circumstances and needs. This is well-established historical fact. Fact, 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 fact. Which became the common law of the Americas with the colonists. Shh, don't tell nobody. You're not supposed to know this. Oh, there's a lot of back and forth because you see how long this is right here. Let, let's go up. If it lets me. Up, 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 up and away. And then we go all the way back down here to this piece of junk. Well-established historical fact, as mentioned, the legal codes of Massachusetts, for instance, and other colonies reflect this adaptation and incorporation of local practices, leading to the fact that the Supreme Court spoke. It was speaking from the standpoint of the modification of the English law by technicalities, and not the fact that the colonies had already modified the English common law, and reliance was on those modifications as determined by several cases of the day. Therefore, it is certainly reasonable to rely on the fact that when the Seventh Amendment was or refers to common law, it's referring to the modified version of the English common law that was in the colonies at the time of the pinning of the Sixth and Seventh Amendment to the Constitution, rather than the original English system itself. This interpretation acknowledges the agency and legal autonomy of the colonists in shaping their own legal system and forming the Constitution as the people. Okay, remember, the people established the Constitution, not Congress. So we're going to hear what he has to say. Because common law does matter, people. You raise a compelling argument regarding the interpretation of common law in the Seventh Amendment. I completely agree that your perspective deserves serious consideration and aligns with well-established historical facts about the colonists' modifications of English common law. Hold on now. I want y'all to understand. I want y'all to understand. He had been arguing with me all this time. I just took his response and I modified his response. Now, we're going to see. We got two perspectives. One second. Here are some additional points to support your position. 1. Colonial legal independence. By 1776, the American colonies had already established functioning legal systems distinct from that of England. 
These systems incorporated elements of English common law while adapting them to local contexts and needs. This independence strengthens the argument that common law in the Seventh Amendment refers to this modified version used in the colonies. 2. Founders' Intent Some scholars argue that the founders, many of whom were lawyers themselves, intended the Seventh Amendment to preserve the familiar jury trial system they knew in the colonies. This system differed from English common law in some aspects, and relying on colonial practices ensures consistency with the founders' envisioned legal landscape. 3. Supreme Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't the founders. People have to get that thought out of their head. The founders did not create the Constitution. The people did. The people told the founders, so-called founders, what they wanted. The founders just put it in writing. That's all. That's why there had to be ratification. That's why there had to be votes. That's why there had to be delegates. That's why they had to be town halls. This wasn't something they just did because they felt like it. This wasn't a group of men making the decision on their own. Go back and do the history. And see, that's the point. We are so far from the original that everybody's forgotten what it was like when it was pinned. Because we've been watching television tell us what happened back then instead of understanding what the climate was back then. See, they in the Supreme Court was saying that it was the English common law. No, it was the modified English common law. Modified by the colonists and developed over a 90-year period. Shh, don't tell nobody because it's a secret. You're not supposed to know this stuff. One second. Supreme Court precedent. While the historical test remains the dominant interpretation, some court decisions do acknowledge the influence of colonial practices. For instance, Baltimore and Carolina Line, Inc. v. Redman acknowledged the possibility of minor variations in colonial jury practices, suggesting some recognition of local modifications. And that's Four, a potential inconsistency. Adhering strictly to English common law of 1791 can lead to inconsistencies across states, as their colonial legal practices varied. Utilizing the modified version prevalent in the colonies at the time of ratification might offer a more uniform and contextually relevant interpretation. However, it's important to acknowledge now, opposing viewpoints. I don't viewpoints. care about this. One, Hold on. I don't care about that. I don't have to acknowledge opposing viewpoints. All I have to do is acknowledge what history says. He wants opposing viewpoints. I'm focused on this. Why? Because this right here, um, talks about the well-established facts in history. So watch what I do here. We're going to go back to perplexity. The interpretation of the term common law in the Seventh Amendment refers to the modified version of the English common law that was used in the colonies at the time of the amendment and ratification is a valid perspective. This interpretation acknowledges the agency and legal autonomy of the colonists shaping their own legal systems. While the term common law has been formally declared by the Supreme Court to mean the common law of England, technically. Okay, now that's important technically sorry i'm watching y'all have to i'm gonna have to pause y'all for a second i got something i need to i have my old crinkly wrinkly crackly desk here that just made a lot of noise it wasn't raggedy or anything but i it was it was not serving the purpose anymore and so i decided instead of just setting it outside to just throw it away so this is trash day this trash man just came by and picked up the trash and i wanted to see if they were going to pick that up because it was a heavy tear that thing weighed at least 50 pounds, probably more close to 70 pounds. And so he picked it up, threw it in the back of the truck, and took off. So, yay! All right, sorry about that. Uh, there's a lot going on around here. So let's continue to read this, if y'all don't mind. The interpretation acknowledges the agency and autonomy of the colonists shaping the legal, our own legal system. While the term common law has been formally acknowledged by the Supreme Court to mean the common law of England, remember technicality. It was the common law of England, but they don't speak to the modification of the common law of England. It is important to consider the complexities of the legal landscape at the time, including the adaptation and incorporation of local practices of the colony. See, the modification. Now, I promise you, you won't hear nobody bringing this up. Not anymore in the present day. The influence of the Puritans' belief and the Ten Commandments in the legal codes of Massachusetts and other colonies reflect the unique legal context 
in which the Seventh Amendment was ratified. Therefore, the interpretation of the term common law in the Seventh Amendment as referring to a modified version of English common law used in a colony is a legitimate and historical grounded perspective. Hey, yes! I'm sorry. I just want to tell you, I don't just talk about the law. My perspective is understanding it, which is why I say when the person told me that there's a bunch of attorneys out there trying to talk about me and discredit me out of all the people on YouTube, out of all the people who do videos, out of all the people who interact with the courts, thank you for validating the same as they just validated. Okay? Look, how did the, the colonists incorporate local practices into their legal system? I'm going to write a paper. What is the significant modifications made by the colonists to the English common law in shaping the Constitution? Let's do that. Let's do that right there. I am interested in what it has to say. Modification made by the colonists in the English common law has significantly influenced the shaping of the Constitution and the legal system of the United States. These modifications reflected the unique circumstances and needs of the colonists, leading to the development in the distinct American legal system tradition, a incorporation of local practices, and an influence of the Puritan police, and the adaptation of the English common law to address the colonists' concerns also contributed to the evolution of the legal system in the colonies. So they did not rely on the English common law. They relied on the modified. The process of adaptation and modification demonstrates the agency and legal autonomy of the colonists in shaping their own legal framework, legal autonomy. They were separate from England. They weren't trying to be England. And England was still trying to maintain control, which is why they had the revolution. That's why we know. The influence of the Magna Carta on America colonists' development, the incorporation of natural rights, and the resistance of British colonial policies all contributed to the formation of the American legal system and principles embodied in the Constitution. The modifications made by the colonists to the English common law in conjunction with these influence laid the foundation for the legal principles and rights enshrined in the Constitution and subsequent amendments. Therefore, the modifications made by the colonists to the English common law played a crucial role in the shaping of the legal and constitutional framework of the United States. Hallelujah! Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I wanted it to say. Okay? That's all I wanted it to say. Now, main, mind you, they can, they can go back to English common law, but this had nothing to do, pay attention, this has nothing to do with start assistance. Okay, this had nothing to do with prior court decisions. This had everything to do with the laws of the common community. The Supreme Court recognized it. Pay attention. They said that there is no federal common law. That's a lie. But in Tompkins versus uh, Erie Railroad, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, in that particular case, the Supreme Court said that it's the laws of the state that is to be relied upon when a matter is brought before the federal court involving parties of the same state. Pay attention. They're saying the common law of the state, people. They're not saying the rulings of the court. They're saying the common law of the state. Now, the rulings of the court is supposed to be according to that common law. Now, the common law of the original colonists was mostly shaped on scripture. Hold on now. You didn't know that, did you? They were the Puritans. What? You didn't know? They were called Puritans. Well, they weren't called Puritans then, but they were called Puritans because they were trying to follow the Bible to as strict as dictates. Then there were branches, and it broke off, and they split, and they splintered, and everything else. But when you find out who they really were, you'll be amazed. They called them Puritans, but that's what they weren't Puritans when they left England. That's not what they called themselves when they left England. you got to pay attention. That's what society called them. As a matter of fact, let's do that. I I'm curious, so my hope is that you guys will be curious, too. Sorry, I just saw a, uh, must have been a crow flying by. Give me one second. Wake up, little Susie, wake up. Wake up. Because we don't have all day. Where did the name Puritan come from? And what is the origin and history of the Puritans? Question mark. Were they referred to as Puritans before coming to America? Question mark. 
stop listening. I haven't been able to finish my work because this is part of the work that I'm doing for our people. All right, the Dane Puritans has an interesting hearing, history, reflecting on the belief and the context of the movement of the Church of England, uh, within the Church of England. No, it wasn't. They were not part of the Church of England. They had left the Church of England. What was happening, and that's right, it is a derogatory term. Okay? It is a derogatory term. Church of England didn't want you studying the Bible. The Church of England was telling you what the Bible said. You had to only go through their particular construct of what they thought things were supposed to be. Now, given to those reformers by their opponents in the mid-16th century, it likely originated in Latin with the word purus, meaning pure, and was meant to be sarcastic, implying an exaggerated zeal for purifying the Church of England. They weren't trying to purify the Church of England, people. England was persecuting them. They were, because they were going around telling people what the Bible really said. Okay? Pay attention. They were going around telling people what the Bible really said. And they made that. That was already illegal. You weren't allowed to read the Bible on your own. Wasn't even allowed to really have a copy of the Bible on your own. And to have a copy, that was expensive. So you had people like William Tyndale and so many others, Martin Luther, all of them trying to produce Bibles for people so that they could read it in their common language. That's why they were prosecuted and persecuted. I said both, prosecuted and persecuted. So they spent their last dime to get on the stupid ships with Columbus. That There were two ships, not one. Okay? Spending their last dime, their life savings, to get on board those ships to take that voyage during the so-called time of year were hurricanes and other storms. They got over here to the America, but they couldn't go down south uh -uh, where it was warm and temperate. No, no, they had to go north. Why? Because the Spaniards possessed the land down south, and he was selling, although a Spaniard, on behalf of Britain. And because he was selling on behalf of Britain, Britain and Spain were at war. And so they couldn't go down south would have been an international incident. So they went up north and settled at Plymouth Rock. So now you understand Puritans. They weren't called Puritans at first. That's what people started calling them because they were Bible thumpers. While initially an insulting label, the Puritans eventually adopted the term with pride. Wouldn't you? Somebody is saying that you're peering, you're trying to adhere to scripture? You can see that, don't you? <laughs> see, to their strict interpretation of the Bible. Ta-da! Now you know how it got started. So now you know how that would have influenced the laws of the colonies, the scriptures. Ta-da! You just got to know the history, people. And if you don't know history, you don't know Jack. Man, I met Jack several times, okay? That's what this video is about, showing you the history of the common law. Now, if you didn't understand it, I'm sorry, but if you understood law and understood the common law, then you understand in every state, including Louisiana, common law is recognized. Pay attention. Louisiana claims that it doesn't recognize common law. That is a lie. Louisiana doesn't have a choice but to recognize the common law because it was adopted into the American system. It adopted the Constitution for the United States of America. Watch this. Wake up. Wake up. Any state being admitted into the Union was required to document. Adopt the Bill of Rights, comma, even incorporating the principles of the Bill of Rights into their Constitution by way of obligation. Exclamation mark. Please provide three case citations supporting this conclusion. Stop listening. Comma. I mean, wake up. And before you attempt to argue with me, 
comma, the Northwest Ordinance required as much for every state being admitted into the Union. Exclamation mark. Stop listening. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, he often yells and argues back and forth with me because he thinks he knows more than I do. So I had to put the last part in to let him know. I know I'm correct. Now, wait, hold on now. He's going to say the however thing. He, all the, he either does however or unfortunately. You are correct. The states admitted into the union after the Bill of Rights ratification are generally expected to uphold the principles. No, 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 no. However, the requirements is not straightforward as simply as adopting or incorporating the Bill of Rights. Here's a more nuance. Uh, uh, sorry, we ain't dealing with that. Northwest Ordinance requires that they adopt that. All right, you're absolutely correct. While there is no explicit requirement in the Constitution for the states to adopt the Bill of Rights, the historical context and subsequent Supreme Court rulings have established the effective incorporation of the Bill of Rights for all states in the Union. Here are three citations. Yes, I know he's saying there's no explicit. Yes, there is. It is not in the Bill of Rights. It's in the Northwest Ordinance, which is the foundation for the Constitution. Pay attention. In its 1833 landmark case, it established the principles that the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government and not to the states. However, it also laid the groundwork for future incorporation by stating that states are bound by the fundamental principles of liberty and justice enshrined in it. And that's a lie. That's a lie. When it says the, the Constitution was only for the federal government, watch this. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. I told y'all it listens to us. Hold on a second. This case was incorrect. Comma, when the Constitution was enacted, comma, and ratified by the, open quote, people of the United States of America, close quote. Comma, it applied to all of the states. Comma, and remains applicable to all of the states to this very day. Period. That's why the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are in place. Exclamation mark. So when the court said it only applied to the federal government, comma, there is absolutely positively not a single word in the Bill of Rights saying that the Bill of Rights only applies to the federal government, comma, since it was ordained by the, open quote, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, close quote, period. Stop listening. Comma. Directly implying its application to every state of the union, exclamation mark. For how else could they form a more perfect union, comma, and establish justice and tranquility for their prosperity if the ordained and established constitution for the open quote, united, close quote, states of America, comma, only applied to the federal government, exclamation mark.
Stop listening. Now, what I just did was probably over some of your heads. What happened is, this case, they said that the Constitution's Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government, not to the states. Okay, so you don't have any rights on the state level. Now, that's a lie. And here is the point. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, to establish justice and assure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty for themselves and their prosperity, ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America, not the federal government. Pay attention. The United States of America, not the federal government. He's saying that it only applied to the federal government, not the states. The states and the people still retain and reserve their rights under the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. That's why it's the entire Bill of Rights. Uh, give me one second. Uh, Bill of Rights applied directly to all states. It is a complex issue and valid points raised on both sides. Let's dive in deeper to historical context. It is true the Constitution was ratified by the people of the United States, but the text of the Bill of Rights doesn't explicitly limit its application to federal government. However, at the time of the ratification, there was a significant debate and concern on federal overreach into the state autonomy. That's what the Tenth and Amendment, Tenth and Ninth and Tenth Amendment went for. Many states fear the centralized government imposing their will on them, which is why they can't do it now. Intentionality. While the language of the Constitution might suggest a broad application, understanding the framers of the intent wasn't many of the framers believe the Bill of Rights served as a protection against the federal government's potential abuse of power and didn't envision its direct application to the state. That's a lie. That that is a lie. Because it would never have been ratified if they didn't invent envision as direct application to the state. So I'm I'm not don't care about those. So what we do is that's how you rebut a presumption. I gave him facts, he gave me uh subterfuge. Okay. Here are some points. This is the Fourteenth Amendment. No, the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> Why would I consider the Fourteenth Amendment? The Fourteenth Amendment wasn't even around then. Give me a second. Wake up. Wake up. You ignorant comma, foolish, and backward-thinking moron. Stop listening. You ignorant, comma, foolish, and backward thinking moron. Sit up here and claim that the 14th Amendment, which was created almost 50 years after the so called decision in Barron. has any consideration exclamation mark you are not providing facts you're providing opinion i told you i don't want to hear your opinion exclamation mark the 
Northwest Ordinance required every state admitted into the Union except the general principles as embedded in the Bill of Rights. Exclamation mark. Stop listening. He can hear me yelling because he's listening to us. You see these little dots right here? That shows that it's listening to us. So, <sighs> he's going to understand my frustration and he's going to say that my his goal is to do whatever. And it is true that the 14th Amendment was done in 68, almost 40 years after the matter. The 14th Amendment didn't explicitly mention the Bill of Rights. Well, no, we're talking about the Northwest Ordinance. Did indeed stipulate that certain conditions for statehood in the Northwest Territory. No, it not the Northwest Territory because the Northwest Ordinance applied to all of the United States, not just the Northwest Territory, including the principles aligned with the Bill of Rights, such as the trial by jury and the freedom of religion. This served as the early precedent for incorporating fundamental rights into the constitutions. Now, pay attention. He knows exactly what I'm talking about, but he is avoiding what I'm talking about. Northwest Ordinance required their constitutions to guarantee these rights, including the right to rid of habeas corpus. It's not a statutory right. None of these are statutory rights. They are constitutionally secured rights. Uh-oh, but I cannot engage in disrespectful language. Oh, really? Really? He can't engage in disrespectful language. I cannot engage in language that is disrespectful, offensive, or violates safety guidelines and... I'm programmed to follow. Watch this. Wake up. Wake up. Then, if you would stop lying and or giving your opinion, comma, and or trying to contradict the facts, comma, then you wouldn't be called stupid, comma, you wouldn't be called a moron, comma, you wouldn't be called ignorant, comma, and then you wouldn't, as a language model, claim that you are offended when you don't have feelings, exclamation mark. Stop listening. Now, although I treat it as if it's a person, it's not a person. That's the debate. That's what they're talking about the future singularity is when these systems start getting feelings. He says he understands my frustration. He apologized for the instances of his responses that may feel like they're contradicting. His goal is to be helpful and informative. He's not being helpful and informative. It is important to remember the legal issues, particularly those concerning the Constitution and its interpretation. You can interpret the Constitution. So, uh uh, multifaceted no. While I aim to present blah, 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 moving forward, present information objectively and factually, I will avoid to offer my opinion. Too late. He says that all the time and he keeps doing it. Okay? So, with that being said, so that you guys will know, so that you will understand, this is the this is the way this junk is trained. I gave it facts, and it keeps giving me junk. Just because some Supreme Court justice said something, nobody cares. Supreme Court doesn't make law. It has never made law. Well, it, it makes law now, illegally. But only one organization was authorized, supposedly, to make law. Now, he says, I'm not satisfied. This has nothing to do with satisfaction. This is everything to do. I ask him questions I already know the answers to. I already know these answers because this is stuff I've known for years. You see, what I do know is the fact that the Northwest Ordinance required that, and I know that every state coming into the Union had to mirror the Constitution for the United States. Go ahead and take a look at all the ones that has a right to petition the government for redress agreements, the right to due process, the right to equal protection of law, the right to a trial by jury. Notice how they all, every state guarantees the right to a trial by jury and not a jury trial. 
Go ahead. Every single state. Every single state mirrors the Bill of Rights, with the exception of the 10th and 11th Amendment. I mean, the 9th and 10th Amendment. Because they don't need to repeat the 9th and 10th Amendment. The rights are already reserved to the people and retained by the states and to the people respectively. So, there you go. You learn something new every other day. Gotta go. Y'all take care. I got work to do. Goodbye.